Padres end of the season, beginning of possible changes. We're going to go a lot of different directions here. Let's start, first of all, with what's going to happen, we think, Monday afternoon. Peter Seidler, the owner recovering from surgery, one of his lawyers from Seidler Equity, the president, Eric Gruppner, Bob Melvin, the manager, A.J. Preller, the general manager, will meet, we believe, Monday afternoon after the conclusion of the regular season, and they will determine what the future of the organization is going to be, John. We're sitting here with a Padre franchise that is in the middle of terrible dysfunction. They're scuffling and struggling and hoping they can <laughs> find a way to back into the playoffs, but it might be too little too late. But the bigger story and the word that's being used from people in and around that organization, the bigger story is the civil war between Preller and Melvin over the operation of the team in the dugout, in the clubhouse, and on the field. At this point in time, the theory is that Seidler wants them both to stay. He wants them to work this thing out. It's been two years running, and it looks like the Preller-Melvin relationship is deteriorated, much like the Preller-Andy Green relationship, the Preller-Jace Tingler relationship, etc. Is Melvin going to walk away? That's possible. Or is there a mandate? We're going to change the way we're going to do business, which means to me, A.J. Preller has put on notice. You must give him his freedom in the clubhouse and in the dugout to run the team that you put together for him. That's what I think the Monday meeting is going to be all about. What's the outcome? I don't know. But I, I am of the opinion they need to keep this together one more year and give them one more year with the mandate. You make some changes, how you interact, how you relate, who makes what decision at what point, who makes the other decision, and who controls the game. That's just my brief overview of where we are in the front office war with the manager in the dugout. Your perceptions. Oh, that, this is an interesting thing because, first of all, um, what are some examples of the meddling that Preller is doing? Is he telling him who to start or who, which relievers to use or who to bat in what part of the order? I mean, what kind of meddling is happening? Here's the volume of the metrics for this afternoon's game. Read it and use it. Hmm. And by the way, this is who is going to play. And by the way, this is whom we recommend is first guy out of the bullpen who doesn't pitch, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of that going on. Okay. Now, Understand, Melvin came from a metric-driven system in Oakland, and I don't think Billy Bean was an easy guy to get along with, and yet they worked together. Mm -hmm. I get the sense that in Oakland, they gave him that sheath of papers, and they had their staff meetings, and then they let him go into the dugout and run the team. I get a different sense here that Preller's fingerprints are on everything, every minute of every day. And, you know, the 32 people who anonymously contributed uh, to the articles in The Athletic and the UT, kind of painted that same picture. Interesting. So I think that has to change. I, I don't think Melvin is pushing back and saying, I don't want to hear from your metric people anymore. Just let me manage the game. But he is pushing back and saying, you gave me this roster. You've given me these metrics. Let me run this thing game time and do mm -hmm. it the way I think it has to be done. So that's where we are with that scenario. I think they should both stay there. Just rearrange the decision-making structure. Somebody has to back off, and I think it's Prella that needs to back off. You build the roster. You give him the roster. You let the man run the clubhouse, run the dugout, and run the game. Agree or disagree? Well, no one likes a micromanager, and that's what we're dealing with here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, they got to make some changes here. So, uh, hopefully, they can come to peace, come to terms. That's where we are as it relates to the, quote, civil war. And that's the latest word that has been used <laughs> by the national media as it relates to A.J. Preller and Bob Melvin. OK, let's look at the names on the lineup list here because they got some really tough decisions to make. And I'm going to walk you through a couple of things here. What Blake Snell has done here is unbelievable. He's got a 1.20 ERA in his last 23 starts. Wow. The only guy that has put up those kind of numbers, 1.20, was Bob Gibson, St. Louis Cardinals, 1968. Wow. 0 0.65 ERA over a 23-game window. 
Blake Snell has almost equaled what Bob Gibson did. Now, Gibson had a phenomenal career. Snell has been Jekyll and Hyde. He's making $16 million a year. He's represented by you-know-who. Scott Boris. Price tag, according to <laughs> Boris, might be $30 mil. I would never pay a pitcher $30 mil. Not on a three-year contract, probably not on a five-year contract. Um, if I were the Padres, I would offer Blake Snell a bump. Maybe $20 million the first year with an option for 25 or if he vests in certain statistics, the second year goes to 25 and hope he takes it. Why? And I'm going to pull this word out of my pocket that probably doesn't fit in any conversation. It's called loyalty. Mm -hmm. They resurrected his career. Tampa Bay got rid of him because he was so erratic. And he was erratic here. And then finally flipped the light switch on and figured a lot of things out at least this summer. But no one has history. That doesn't guarantee it'll be like that next summer. I would try to bump him to 20 uh, with, with clauses that could push it to 25, maybe over two years. And if Boris says no, then you have to cut cut ties. Josh Hader, price tag $13 million. Really rock-solid guy. Probably a $20 million relief pitcher per year. That's the going price for the guys that's upper echelon there. I'm a little bit taken back by this stuff that's just happened within the last couple of weeks about availability. Yeah, really. I, I know my arm and what I can do and what I don't want to do and what I've been allowed to do. And I was kind of offended when they're fighting for their playoff life. This guy's only pitched, I think it's 15 innings now since August 1st. And it's the end of September. 15 innings. Right. So I, I have a problem with that. But he's earned a bump maybe to 20. Juan Soto, arbitration eligible. His price will probably go to 30 this season. I would just sit there and let him continue to play on a contract year. See if he can reproduce it. Then you have to make the decision because you got to deal with you-know-who. Scott Boris. Okay, here we go. <laughs> now, other decisions. Michael Walker, spectacular year. Padres had a really good year at Boston. If the Red Sox had him, they'd probably be in the playoffs because he's been rock-solid reliable. He's fought through some issues. There's an option there. What do they do? Two years, $32 million. That's a $16 million per season bump. I guess I'd give Waka $16 million on a one- or two-year contract. I don't know what they're going to do with Lugo. He's got an option. Uh, he's making seven point five. He's been trustworthy at the back end. Maybe I bump him to 10. I don't go beyond that because nobody pays their fourth or fifth or sixth starters $15 million. Mm -hmm. And Lugo sat there forever and ever before he finally got signed because everybody had questions about him. He's been more than adequate, but he's been okay. Nick Martinez. Uh, he's got an option that could afford him $8 million per season the next two seasons if the Padres pick up that two-year option. He's been pretty serviceable. $8 is kind of high for kind of a back-of-the-rotation, first guy out of the bullpen guy. It's the going rate. So here's the question, and I don't have an answer for it, John, but since you wanted to co-host out in <laughs> left field, you're going to give me an opinion on this. Okay. All those names I mentioned, mm -hmm. if you keep them in place at the pay raises I just handed out, it's a $46 million increase to the payroll. Right. So the burning question is, where do you get the $46 million from? How do you do that? Because you're tacking on more money to each of these guys without taking care of Soto, except Soto will get an arbitration-type contract. So you tell me who you keep who you delete, where's the $46 million coming from if you're going to take the payroll down from 253 down to 200 John, the well, table is yours. If they're going to, yeah, if they're going to bring the payroll down to 200 they can't keep any of these guys. I mean, well, they have to keep Soto because he's under contract, but, you know, Snell and, um, and Waka and Lugo are going to walk, um, you know, and then, you know, Nick Martinez, I guess, is it a player option or a club option? Club a club. So they might let them walk too if they want to get down to 200 because apparently there's something going on with the debt ratio, you know, that they need to get down but according to MLB rules. But, you know, in my fantasy dream world, um I would make the same offer to Snell. Um, you know, give him a bump, hope he he takes it to stay here cuz he he's had such great success here and he loves Mud and Dawn, you know, and all of that. 
But, you know, Hader needs to walk. We can plug in Suarez. Lugo and Waka have been tremendous. It'd be great to keep those guys as back end. Martinez, he's a little shaky, but I think you hang on to him too. As far as Soto goes, you know, again, in my utopia, you keep him too. He's had a great year with his OPS is over 900. He's had 30 home runs, 100 RBIs. He's been killing it lately. And he's playing like the Soto that we always expected. So why wouldn't he duplicate it next year? I think he's still trying to work a long-term deal with it. But if the mandate is to get to 200 million, well, you're screwed because you got the Fab Four. They're all locked in. I mean, you don't have much flexibility. Here's a sidebar angle to all these economic things we're just talking about. Uh, plain and simple, they don't have a sixty million dollar a year TV contract now. Oh, so yeah. that's that's money that's not coming in the door effective next year. I think the TV rights fee, even though MLB's taking it over, can be a lot less. On top of that, by not making the playoffs this year, not having home playoff games, that's $10 million revenue that they're not getting wow. from what would have been playoff game home revenue. Yeah. It's a, it's a big issue. Uh, that being said, you know, they busted the all-time attendance record, John, of over 3 million, 3.23 million this year nice mega profits ticket prices are going up they keep this core together these guys bounce back and have a really good season next year sky's the limit in terms of revenue and i think i would think profits now yeah. whether whether that means a 250 million dollar payroll again i don't know so there's there's a lot of ancillary dollar questions that are out there right now so we'll see what monday brings as it relates to the Civil War conversation, and then obviously the evaluation as the offseason begins, and who's going to be making those decisions, and what are they willing to spend? It's going to be really interesting. So we, we will go from the baseball season to a very busy offseason, effective Monday morning if there's no playoff game. Oh, yeah, it'll be like a Black Monday, right, like they uh, like they have in the NFL. Um, but, you know, we, we never really can see the books of these franchises. And I think, what is it, Fortune Magazine will usually kind of do a, an estimation of their profitability. But it makes you wonder, like, if you were looking at the Padres as a business entity, their annual revenue, their annual expenses, are they profitable? Are they losing money? Is Seidler going into his pocket? I mean, obviously, they're going to make the money down the road when the franchise value keeps going up and he sells it. He'll cash out. But I often wonder that even in a situation like this where the TV revenue is down, the, the expenses for the 253 million payroll are way up, is it profitable? Is it, a, is it a profitable enterprise? And I'm not sure if we're ever going to know. I think history writes that the owners kept having to have cash calls. Now, they weren't real good teams for a chunk of time. Mm -hmm. And prices were going up, the Kevin Brown contracts and all that. And the owners had to keep going to cash calls. But that was that was a different set of circumstances. This is Petco Park. This is Gaslamp. This is Padres own the market economically in terms of corporate sponsorship because the Chargers vacated. So I think I think the dollar numbers are really different now than they were under the Croc era. They were obviously under oh, the yeah. terrible Tom Werner times, <laughs> uh, and and, and the dollar dollar values are even greater now than they were in the John Moore's successful run with Larry Lacino. It's it's really interesting to see where they're going to go, and money is driving what will be a lot of decisions. So that's what I would do if I were king. Hey, want to remind.